And our first speaker is, uh, is uh, Ming Xiao from Penn State University. And uh, Ming is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Penn State. He's a geotechnical, works on geotechnical engineering issues, earthquake engineering uh, design. And he's gonna speak to us about the impacts of uh, uh, permafrost thawing and how to use distributed temperature sensing to look in, in uh, cryosphere environments and looking at, at permafrost behavior. So Ming, if you, you have shared your screen, you're all set, we can see you. So you are on, thank you. And you are, you are muted. There we go, there you thank go. you for that. Well, um, I'd like to uh, give a, a brief uh, talk about uh, the uh, in situ monitoring of a permafrost uh, using a DTS. And a permafrost is the uh, is a ground and uh, under zero degree uh, temperature for at least two consecutive years. Well, uh, my colleagues at Universal Alaska Fairbanks and had the uh, temperature uh, uh, sensors along uh, the central part of the uh, Alaska, and uh, and you can see the the temperature change uh, significant in the past forty years, and particularly in the northern Alaska, as you see in the. Uh, in the right upper uh, uh, figure. And just for example, uh, in, in, in the Dead Horse, and, uh, uh, which is uh, close to the Apulo Bay, the largest oil field uh, in, the, in, in America. Uh, and uh, you can see the temperature changes from about a negative 8.5 uh, in, uh, in 1978 and to close to a negative uh, 5 degrees Celsius uh, in 2000. And, um, so the, uh, the, the, the climate change has significant impact on the, uh, the ground uh, temperature. And uh, my colleagues at uh, UAF and had a permafrost model and, uh, and looking at uh, two coastal communities. One is Ugyavik, the other is Wainwright. At present, at present day, you can see the temperature is are about uh, you know, negative uh, eight degree and, uh, and it's still uh, stay frozen. And uh, if uh, we don't do anything to the climate change and uh, say business as usual, at the end of the, uh, the century, and uh, you can see and in Wainwright, the permafrost uh, would have thawed. And uh, then in Ugyavik, uh, formerly known as a barrel, and, uh, and the ground is close to thawing. And uh, there are lots of issues related to the permafrost thawing. And, uh, and this is a few pictures I took in Ugyavik and you can see you know, regardless of the uh, the building uh, size or type, and they are supported, uh, you know, using uh, uh, piles, and the piles go through the uh, active layer, which is the uh, seasonal uh, free thaw layer, into the upper frost, and uh, which is supposed to be a very rigid um, ground bearing uh, layer. But uh, with the uh, uh, ground temperature change, and you can see the uh, active layer becomes uh, uh, thicker. When the pile end, you know, is no longer in this kind of a solid permafrost, and then that can cause the uh, the building uh, uh, to collapse and lots of many, uh, you know, infrastructure um, damages. In fact, uh, you know, here just shows a few example, and uh, the thawing permafrost can cause landslide, and it can um, cause the uh, you know, a different settlement, and uh, you know. In this case, uh, causing the uh, foundation failure and building collapse in a Siberia. And uh, the, uh, the roads, if it's paved, and uh, oftentimes it looks like a roller coaster because of the uh, um, settlement. Now, to speak, the uh, you know, uh, 1,300 kilometer long the, uh, Trans Alaska pipeline system that takes the oil from the Pulu Bay and all the way to the southern part of Valdez, then transported to uh, in, uh, New Orleans and uh, uh, Texas. And then um, if the pull over thaws and uh, you know, the pipeline uh, could break, right? So this project we started this year is to understand the, the uh, in situ and long-term geophysical and geomechanical properties of degrading permafrost in the Arctic. If we know those pro uh, properties and can forecast this, then we can predict the foundation or infrastructure performances. So, um, and uh, this is a collaborative um, uh, project. And here on this photo, we have Dr. Eileen Martin from Virginia Tech, and uh, she's moving to uh, Colorado School of Mine. We have three graduate students, Xiao Hang Di, Ming Liu, who is in the audience today, and Nolan Roth, and also Dr. Ann Jensen um, and, uh, from uh, uh, Ugyavik. 
uh, two collaborators of Ti Yuan Zhu uh, in geoscience at Penn State and Dmitry Nikolsky uh, in, from, from UAF. We also have a support from DOE, NOAA, and UIC Science for logistic support. And particularly, we want to thank uh, the Center for Transformative Environmental Monitoring Programs, or CTABs, and uh, particularly Scott, and John, and Chris, and for helping us with the uh, instrumentation. As uh, um, Scott mentioned earlier about uh, the, uh, the the functionality of the of the uh, of DTS, and we couple DTS with the uh, distributed acoustic sensing of, or, or DAS, and uh, and uh, the uh, DTS function is similarly uh, to DAS. So we installed the uh, uh, DTS and uh, and DES or DAS cables in and uh, in the tundra of the Ugavik, uh, uh, and here shows the uh, Google map. And we started at the DOE um, arm facility and go along the uh, service road around the uh, NOAA building and extend into the tundra and ended close to the Elson Lagoon, which is connected to with the uh, Arctic Ocean. And this is about a two kilometer long. Here shows the uh, uh, drone video I took. See, this is the, the NOAA building and uh, the service road, DOE facility, and then uh, that uh, uh, extends toward the uh, Elson Lagoon. As you can see, uh, closer to uh, the uh, NOAA and the DOE facilities, uh, the ground is uh, drier. And uh, as we uh, move closer to the uh, coast, and uh, the ground becomes much wetter. And this, and uh, we installed the cable in from late August to uh, uh, early September, about two weeks. And this is the, uh, the season that we saw, you know, this is the ground um, uh, condition. And here, this is the, uh, the drone we're looking at uh, close to the uh, coast and looking uh, uh, from the coast and looking uh, toward the, uh, the facilities. And this is the, the permafrost and uh, uh, you can see the uh, characteristic uh, ice wedge polygon shape. And uh, this is due to the thawing of a permafrost. And I'm not sure if you can see in this middle, uh, and we have our teams in here. And it's really hard to walk you know, on the tundra. And the ground is very soft, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's quite flat. And we, you know, we go into land and in there and just stay there for the whole day. Well, um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we couple the uh, DAS and TTS uh, and, uh, cables uh, together. And here the, on the left, you can see this is uh, the, the DTS cable and uh, provided by CTANS. And uh, it's uh, quite uh, heavy and about, it's over uh, 50 uh, kilograms. Uh, and uh, it's uh, almost impossible to carry that. And with the, uh, with the screw, and it's very heavy. And with the, you know, all the gears we have to carry on the tundra, it's really possible to carry this heavy uh, and weight. So we unspool it and uh, make it into a small bundles. And so that uh, you know, uh, each bundle is, you know, we can carry uh, uh, by a person. And uh, the, the DTS cable is quite rigid. And so it's, you know, it's, it's quite challenging to make it into a, a small spools. On the left, you can see, and you know, after we, we have a, you know, the, a big bundle of the DTS and DAS cables, and then we move to, you know, to the field. Here's the, uh, the uh, video that we deployed the uh, DTS cable. Oh, always oh. good side of that. <laughs> the paparazzi is here. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, hang on. So, um, how did we install it? And uh, uh, one shovel at a time. And uh, the active layer, which is seasonal free thaw layer, and at that point, uh, the season is still uh, thawed. And uh, the, uh, the thickness is about uh, um, from probably you know uh, 10 centimeter to a 30 centimeter uh, deep. It's about a shovel depth. So we we, we push a shovel into the uh, ground and uh, reach the permafrost table, which is a solid uh, ice, you know, rock, 
uh, like ice. And then we tilt the, the, the shovel and open a crevice and put the uh, DTS and a dust cable in. And then we remove the shovel and let the crack close and we gently tamp on the ground. Um, uh, and uh, on the right, you can see this is uh, right after we uh, finish the cable installation. You can see there's a still mark. After a few days, and we won't be able to identify where the cables are. But of course, we have uh, the, the GPS locations of the entire route. Lots of challenges, and uh, uh, you know the uh, weather is uh, uh, is pretty uh, cold and uh, particularly very windy. And uh, we brought food and water in, and just to stay there, you know, for, and, uh, for the entire day. So um, um, other challenges, including the uh, uh, the splicing. And a particular splicing in, in a field, and uh, with the uh, wind and the cold uh, uh, temperature, and the uh, tangling and detangling of, uh, of the uh, DTS um, um, uh, cable. So after uh, you know uh, ten days of uh, hard work, and uh, this is at the uh, end point, and uh, this is me taking a video and also speaking with excitement. All right. So this is our last point. For the uh, cable installation, last shovel. This end of the uh, DTS. Oh, and and a dust. Maybe DTS cable left. But uh, this is the end of uh, the dust cable. Zero meter. One more. Cool. Last one. <laughs> 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 All right. I didn't get the last shovel. Thanks to Anne. We did not encounter a polar bear, yeah. so we did not get used to the shotgun. Yeah. And we got to the right place. Yeah. Yeah, so. What a know, nice day, beautiful day. Okay, the rest of the crew finishing up the uh, installation. I already celebrated. Yeah, so there. we were saying the professors <laughs> celebrate while the grad we students work. Oh, what, what a typical. Uh -huh. no, like, we took a photo of us working hard and you guys celebrating over there. Okay, yeah, yeah. We pre celebrated already. <laughs> yeah. So, and I uh, just uh, uh, very quick, I know that almost time for my presentation, and I, I show you just like a, a uh, a two minutes video, and this is uh, from uh, Arnie Martin. Hi, I'm Irene Martin. I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Tech, and um, I'm here in Akiaka, Alaska, in the DOE Arm Building. So, this is a, a climate study where we're looking at permafrost thaw, and we've got two kilometers of fiber optic cable, both single mode and multi mode, embedded in the permafrost outside of this building. So this one is the DAS, which Nolan Roth is going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the DTS, which is Distributed Temperature Sensing. And we borrowed this system from CTEMPS, which is a great facility uh, if you want to get into temperature sensing with fiber. So now inside of the case, we've actually got a whole computer in here. And then we've got our Distributed Temperature Sensing Interrogator right here. And you can see right now, it's recording data on channel one. So we've actually got both ends of the fiber in and they're actually connected to each other two kilometers away, so it makes a big loop, and that helps us get a more accurate measurement. So in here, let's say that I wanted to look at what the data looks like recently. So with this, we're able to see a profile of every segment along the fiber optic cable, all the way down and then all the way back, of what is the temperature there, and we get that measurement every two minutes, which is a lot faster than the permafrost is probably changing most of the time but it helps us have more data and track if there are any changes with what's happening. All right, so we see that most of our data, our temperature is hovering just a little bit above zero, so around zero to um, one degrees. It seems like we've got some interesting patterns and a lot of uh, variability spatially in our temperature in this permafrost area. We know that the temperature is very different in small spatial scales, so that's, that's gonna be really great to have those dense measurements. That's a slide, and uh, this is and uh, this is only a part of uh, our uh, entire project. Here, I don't mean to you know describe each of the individual tasks, and uh, but I want you to see you know as highlighted in, in, in red and how do we use the DTS um, um, data? Well, uh, we're going to use the uh, DAS uh, technology to uh, measure the uh, shear and primary wave velocities, 
and uh, using those velocities and to correlate with, uh, with the soil properties, which we'll use for the infrastructure uh, 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 analysis. So we want to uh, we know, correlate the uh, permafrost temperature uh, measured from DTS and the P and S wave velocity measured uh, uh, um, from DAS. And that's the first. And then we're also going to use the DTS data to calibrate the uh, permafrost model. And then uh, and, uh, we can, uh, uh, based on the permafrost model for a future climate, such as an RCP 8.5, 4.5 scenario, and we can and, uh, predict what the ground temperature is going to change in the future. And then use the model, we can correlate uh, to the uh, P wave and S wave velocity. And from there, we can predict the future changes of the permafrost property eventually for the uh, future infrastructure uh, uh, prediction. So uh, I don't have data to share at this point because we only uh, installed the uh, cable two months ago. And this project is uh, uh, funded by Signals in the Soil program of the ASF. Thank you.